Hello! It is a Saturday edition of The Promise Diaries and special secret sauce. I have my mom and dad here. Hi! <laughs> <laughs> so they are in the studio with me. Um, and uh, before we get going, let's do a song. Now, I thought of the tone I was going to start so I don't go too high. But I don't remember, so we're just going to start, and then we're going to see how it goes. Um, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me. Mold me, fill me, use me, Spirit of the Living God, fall afresh on me. Good morning. So, it is Saturday, 21st of January. Take a little drink of my drink first, please. Mm. So good. Okay. So today, my mom gave me this little book. She gave me two. And one of them had um, different promises about personal promises and stuff. I looked through all of the um, index and stuff. And there was a whole, there was a question on the chunk of, who is the Holy Spirit and what is he in our lives? And I'm like, that is fortuitous because that is what I'm talking about. So I looked up the verses and I kind of was going through some of the stuff. It was so good. So let me just start with saying the Holy Spirit is a gift from God that we get when we accept Jesus. That's who the Holy Spirit is, right? The Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity. And I know that's a confusing word, right? But there's God, the Father. There's his son, Jesus, and there's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a deity and a personality unto himself. It says in the Bible in the beginning that the spirit of God hovered above the waters, right? It, there's The spirit is his own thing. So when Jesus died on the cross, right, making the bridge, restoring us back to God the Father, the gift of salvation was that God sent the Holy Spirit to us, right? We get the Holy Spirit. So that's who the Holy Spirit is, but let's start with this. In Acts 2, I'm just going to list some verses, give you a synopsis of some of them. You can write them down if you want to, um, but just listen. <laughs> listen. When we get to Romans 8, I might just read the whole chapter. I mean, <laughs> I was reading it this morning and I was like, oh. So good. So anyway, but here's some here's some things. Acts 2.38. Peter is talking to a group of people, and basically it says, you repent, right? You repent of your sins. You're baptized. Um, your sins are forgiven because of what Jesus Christ did. And the gift to you, as a gift, you get the Holy Spirit. 1 John 3.24. Uh, we abide in God. And God abides in us through his spirit. 2 Corinthians 1.22, the Holy Spirit is a pledge and a promise from God, right? The proof of our salvation is the Holy Spirit, the pledge and the promise that he gives us, right? So Ephesians 1.13 and 14, through our belief in Jesus, we are sealed through the Holy Spirit or with the Holy Spirit, it, it's God's pledge to us and our proof of salvation that we are owned by God and then redeemed to him. Here's the thing. All things were made by him and for him. All God created all things. The thing is that when you accept Jesus, because God's perfect, remember the other day in salvation, we talked about Jesus. God had to send his son so that he could make the bridge, so that he could make a way to restore his babies back to himself. And as a gift, he sends us the Holy Spirit. 
The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same spirit that you get to have as a child of God. And it's it's being owned by the Lord and restored back to himself, right? Through the Holy Spirit. Okay. Romans 5, 5, God pours out his love to us through the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26, the Holy Spirit is a helper. 1 Corinthians 2, 10, man has a spirit. You've got a spirit, right? Who can know your thoughts? You have your own spirit and your thoughts like outside of God. God knows all. But I'm saying, if you and I are hanging out, I don't know your thoughts. Your spirit and you, you know your own thoughts, right? The spirit of God knows God's thoughts. The spirit of God searches all things, even the depths of God, right? Okay, moving on. Romans 8, 26 and 27, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. So when we don't know how to pray and we're not sure what to say, the Holy Spirit prays for us on our behalf using groanings and spirit and words that can't even be understand or comprehended, but by God, but the Holy Spirit knows the depths of God and the will of God, and he knows the depths of us too. So he prays on our behalf. 2 Corinthians 3.17, the Lord, it basically, 2 Corinthians 3.17 is inferring to the Lord and the Holy Spirit being one, right? Like, like the Trinity is kind of referring to that. But in the Holy Spirit, there is liberty, right? You know, people look at Christianity like um, if they're not saved, like a shackle or like, oh no, I'm going to have to, you know, give up all of my wily ways. Listen, there is freedom and liberty in Christ. You know why? Because you are not shackled to sin and death anymore. You're not shackled to what the world thinks anymore. How's that working for you? I mean, you know, are you loving waking up with a hangover next to someone you don't know? Or feeling hopeless and empty? I mean, you're sad about giving that up? I, I can't, I can't <laughs> listen, <sighs> open your hand and let it go. You're going to feel so much better. <laughs> okay. Moving on. The Bible is God's love letter to you. He gives you these things and talks about these things because he loves you so much. He does. He wants to keep you from harming your own self. Baby, that's going to burn. That's going to hurt. That is going to be an injury that's going to last a while. I'm trying to protect you from that, right? That's what God's saying to you. So anyway, liberty and freedom. Romans 8, 2. The Holy Spirit sets us free from sin and death. He helps us to know what is freely given to us by God. He raised Jesus from the dead. Same Holy Spirit lives in us. Here's a couple things. Holy Spirit is God. We talked about that three in one. And let me explain also, if you didn't hear my other thing, um, in Jewish culture, the son has the same authority as the father. So if you're talking to the son of a household, he's got the same authority as the, as the dad has. And so that's how I can explain Jack Hibbs, who I love. That's how he explained it once. And it was like, that was the first time it made sense to me. Right. Um, is that, you talk to the son, you talk to the father, same authority. They're completely different people, but they have the same authority, right? Similar. I mean, you know, anyway, the Holy Spirit is our comforter. He comforts us. It's a gift God gives us so that we can have a comforter. We, The Holy Spirit always points back to Jesus because if Jesus hadn't died on the cross, no man gets to the father, but through Jesus. And so God sends us his Holy Spirit through Jesus, right? So he's our comforter. He's our counselor. He counsels us. You feel those nudgings about doing the right thing or if you're going the wrong way, Holy Spirit. He's our teacher. He helps to teach us when you're reading the word or when you're watching a pastor. He helps to illuminate and teach you things that you need to know because he knows the heart of God and he's living in you. He prays for us, but like we said above, he intercedes to God for us. He's a gift to us with salvation. He see, I love this. He seals us to God. I just love that. I'm sealed to God 
through the Holy Spirit. He's our helper. He gives us liberty. He sets us free from sin and death. God's pledge to us of our inheritance, right? He points to Jesus and he searches all things, even the depths of God, so that we can, re so he can reveal to us the will of God, right? So here's, here's how I look at it too. Okay, we'll get back to chapter eight. Before Jesus, right? Before you're saved, you're just like, like a dead man walking, right? You have hopelessness. You're empty. You're heart sick. You're striving for things that are never going to fill you. And there's this hopelessness about it. After Jesus, you cross the bridge of the cross of Christ and God waits for you. And when you accept Christ, you bury the dead man walking. And the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, he raises you to walk in a new life. You inherit the kingdom. I'm excited about that. <laughs> you receive hope. When you accept Christ, you went from hopeless to hopeful. You went from dead man walking to salvation. You went from heart sick to purpose. You went from eternal death to eternal life. You went from living with the world's shackles on you to the Holy Spirit and power in Jesus Christ. Right? Gifts from God through Jesus, through the Holy Spirit. So let's see. God reaches out to hold us to himself, finally restored to him as a gift. We get the Holy Spirit. All right, so I want to read to you something. Sorry, allergies. Listen, I really want to read the whole chapter of chapter 8. It's Romans chapter 8. I mean, I really want to read the whole thing. I'll summarize a few things, and then, and then I'm going to read something that just yeah, makes me happy. So, um... Let's see. I want so in chapter eight, it's talking about living according to the flesh. Your minds are set on the flesh, right? And those who live according to the spirit, their minds are on things of the spirit. For the mind that's set on the flesh is death, but the mind that's set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind that's set on the flesh is hostile towards God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. And if Christ is in you, through, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who indwells you. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh for if you're living according to the flesh you must die but if by the spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body meaning crucifying those selfish wills and things you want to do every day like um deeds of the body you will live for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by which we, we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider, this is the part that gets so good. For I consider the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. For the anxious longings of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. Listen. If you didn't praise and if man didn't praise God, the rocks would cry out because everything was made by him and for him. And it says creation eagerly waits the return of the Lord. Let's see. For the creation was subject to futility, not of its own will, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pain of childbirth together until now. And not only this, 
but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the spirit, right? The Holy Spirit gives you and helps produce the fruits of the spirit, you know, joy, patience, peace, love, and kindness. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons and daughters, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one also hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. And in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And whom he predestined, these he also called. And whom he called, these he also justified and whom he justified these he also glorified what then shall we say to these things if god is for us who is against us he who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all how will he not also with him freely give us all things who will bring a charge against god's elect God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for thy sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's right. Oh my gosh, isn't that a good chapter? <laughs> I love, like chapter eight is so good, but starting at like verse 18, I mean, it throws down. It's like, oh, it's just so good. So listen, when you are saved, when you, when you crucify the old person you were, right in the spirit, and you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the promise of the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit seals you to God himself. He comforts you. He counsels you. He teaches you. He searches the things of God and, and, and makes them known the will of God to you. He prays on your behalf. Like it's a, to it's a total gift of God. It's like God is here. And you are, God's here and you're here. Jesus died. And you're like, I'm empty. I'm hopeless. This, this sucks. And you learn about the freedom and the salvation, the gift of eternal life through Jesus. And you accept Jesus. And you get to cross the cross of Christ so that you can be sealed back to God. And God takes you and he says, oh my gosh, my baby is home and you're restored to me. And as a gift... I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom and my Holy Spirit, right? Um, there was a story to wrap it up. There was a story that I heard um, someone on social media say about this man. And this man had all of these really expensive pieces of art over time, right? Just all of these really expensive pieces of art. And his son also liked to paint and kind of dabble in art. So he paints this picture and it's, you know, it's like whatever, you know, but he loved his son so much. So he puts it, oh, oh, no, the story, oh, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. 
doesn't even matter. I'm going to make it my own. So anyway, he puts it in the middle of all of his expensive pieces of art. Okay. And he puts it on the wall in big, beautiful, what up frame and stuff. Anyway, so the old man dies and, um, they have an auction for all of his beautiful art and people come from far and wide because this man had a collection and they start with the piece of art that his son made. And it's like, you know, whatever. No one bids on it. And they want the auctioneer to move on. And the auctioneer is like, look, it's in the will. We're starting with this piece. We're going to start with the piece of art from his son. So he starts at like a thousand. No one bids. He goes down into the hundreds. No one bids. He goes down to like $50. And everybody's like, come on, getting upset. They're like, whatever. They want the good stuff. So this man in the back who used to work for the old man, loved the old man, uh, just kind of a, a, one of his employees says, I'll buy the piece. I, I loved the man and I, I only have $10 to my name right now, but I'll, I'll buy the piece of art because I really love this man. And so he sells it. He pounds the gavel and he says, okay, the auction's over and everybody uproars. And he says, listen, it's in the will. Whoever takes the son's work takes it all. Mm -hmm. I'm not selling anything else. You take the son, you get it all. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's so good. You can't, if you have a, your baby and they die and they sat, whatever, you love your kid. And God is like, this is the only way you get to me is to pay the price for your sins. I sent my son to be the sacrifice. You take my son and you get the keys to the kingdom, but you don't take my son. You chose not to take my son. And then you have to depart from me because I don't know you. Anyway, it was so good. Anyway, so that was that. You take the sun, you get it all. You don't take the sun, you have to drive through. I'm sorry. So I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. Um, I love you like a crazy person. Be good to one another. Don't forget you're one of the one another's. Don't forget to be good to yourself. I love you and I mean it, peanut. Mwah.